All right. Great. Um, welcome to uh, Talking Data Equity for Friday, February 17th, 2023. My name is Heather, uh, Heather Krause, and I'm coming to you from Toronto. I am the founder of a project for data equity, which is called We All Count. And one of the favorite parts of my week is this thing we do on Fridays called Talking Data Equity. And this is an informal gathering that anyone who is working on data equity can attend. And the idea is that we, we get together, we remind ourselves that we are not alone in this pursuit, and we try and learn some practical uh, ways to increase the equity in uh, what we're doing. And sometimes we have topics and sometimes we have special guests. And today is a special guest day. And um, I am so excited, like I know many of you are, to introduce uh, our special guest, Fraruza Shoku Vaja. And <laughs> she's nodding because I was practicing. I wanted to respect uh, her with the correct pronunciation of her name. And um, she is a, an important person and a, a very, uh, a person who's doing all kinds of different things. We will include uh, a full biography and lots of links to her materials. Uh, she teaches at Franklin and Marshall College. Uh, she's a sociologist and a journalist. I met her through the world of journalism, where she's an important part of Global Voices Online. And she does work in interesting places on topics like feminism, colonialism, how do we do research in a way that doesn't just perpetuate oppression, but still gives us meaningful, interesting, reliable, rigorous knowledge. Uh, so of course, that's right up our alley. And um, I'm going to stop talking now. Again, when we put the video up, in our data equity community forum that I'm gonna give you a link to right now. When we put the video up, we will also put up links to uh, lots, lots of uh, Fruza's work, uh, including links to an upcoming book and other things that you can read. So I'm going to stop talking now and turn turn it over and say thank you so much. Uh, I should mention Feruza lives in Philadelphia, but is coming to us from Puerto Rico and is on sabbatical. So if you're an academic, you know how valuable that time is. And she's giving us this hour. Um, so thank you so much for being willing to spend time with us. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Heather, so much for that. Such a kind uh, introduction and uh, in this invitation, I feel really excited and thrilled and honored. And I'm looking at all these little squares here and it's so exciting. There's so many people. Um, so yeah, so I think Heather already told you basically a little bit about me. You, We can talk more about that in, uh, in the Q&A, which I'm really, really, really looking forward to. I think it's probably the best always part of these talks. And um, I'm in Puerto Rico, yeah. Um, so it's, this is where I'm from. Uh, uh, but my name, just in case you were asking yourself, my name is also Iranian. Uh, so my father is from Iran. Um, so anyway, with that said, uh, I can. Uh, I'm going to start here. Let me see if I can share the screen. Um, and see this just a second and then wait let me see how I can make this work so share screen and then if I hit something here on the desktop wait I'm not sure let me see should I open the PowerPoint on my desktop and then share it? Uh, yes, probably. Yeah, I think that's how it, it works. Let's see. Let's give that a go. Let's see how. Okay.
Any luck? You know, technology, right? Talking about technology. Of course, now it doesn't want to open. No worries. It's not uh, surprising when it doesn't work. It's actually amazing when it does work. We have so much technology that sometimes we forget. So, okay, there's a version here that's working. It's not the PowerPoint version. It's the keynote version, but I that, had prepared. That still so be on. fine. Yeah. yeah. I just, the other one has subtitles and, mm. you know. Okay. Can you see that? We can. We can see the slides and we can also see the slides down the left, which um, isn't a problem for us. Can I, can I, but, yeah, I wonder if, oh, maybe here on play, but then, oh, there, yep, that's there better. you go. And now okay. if you use your arrow keys, you'll be able to move my arrow button. keys. Perfect. Okay, so hello everyone. This is going to be a presentation uh, on um, basically on a part of my forthcoming book, um, which is called In Defense of Solidarity and Pleasure, Feminist Technopolitics from the Global South. It's forthcoming in fall with Stanford University Press. I'm very excited to be presenting a part of this book. It's only based on one chapter of the book because you know it's, it's, it's a pretty long book. Uh, but again, we can talk about anything. I have a whole chapter, for instance, on, on methods and uh, how I approach my research with the activist communities I work with. And we can also talk a little bit about that. And um, so, and I'm also going to focus a little bit more on hopeful aspects of my of my research because I'm very critical also right and I think that's really important and necessary but I think sometimes we also there's a lot of hope also in my work and I think in the world we're living particularly um you know we need to hang on uh to hope right so um basically in briefly kind of a synopsis of the book it 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 it's it, it looks at of how over the past 25 years, basically a little bit, 25 years, 30 years, there has been a race to include women and other oppressed communities in the digital society. The importance of integrating women as users, producers, consumers, designers, and development developers of technologies has become kind of a global mantra against inequality. Prominent strategies include capacity building, training in, di in digital information and communication technologies, ICTs for entrepreneurship, fintech, which is a pretty new development, and fostering the participation and retention of women in science and technology fields in education and the workforce. But I argue that this exciting future being constructed in which women are considered key figures full of potential contains in its fold subtle and not so subtle forms of violence. So drawing from archival and ethnographic research, my work examines both how mainstream development discourse mostly centered around the United Nations, because I look at the global south, so I look at development, and tech corporations, and also the state, particularly in Costa Rica, um, focused on women and digital technologies, produces an exemplary figure that I called, that I call the third world technological woman. And how, at the same time, feminist digital activists contest and negotiate this construction and this discourse and these policies, right? So development agencies, um, uh, combine this woman, create this, this figure that I call the third world technological woman that combines technological dexterity and keen entrepreneurial instinct 
with gendered stereotypes like care and selfless, selflessness and nurturing. So this is a very nurturing figure, right? And this figure, this woman is supposed to magically thrive amid numerous forms of violence and precariousness. It, so care, close and intimate relationships become potential sites of profit through this, these digital technologies. And we see this a lot with FinTech, right? Uh, which I'm not going to be focusing on today, but we can definitely talk more about. Um, Rosa, I'm going to. Fruza, I'm going to interrupt for one second because the slides aren't moving and we think they're supposed oh, to be. Oh, I'm, I'm not moving them yet. Okay. Fabulous. Yes. <laughs> we're, we just got worried. Our tech people were worried. No, I'm not moving them yet. Don't worry. This is, it, I'm just starting. <laughs> my interruption. I'm so sorry. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Don't worry. So, um, so this woman is a figure right for new forms of intervention, right? Such as data extraction, surveillance, and online violence. At the same time, feminist digital activists in the global South involved in development work mobilize a politics of care rooted in solidarity, which is what I'm going to focus on today, pleasure and joy in negotiating and defying these techno-capitalist paradigms of digital inclusion. And inclusion is tricky, right? Um, it's a tricky, it's a tricky uh, concept. Uh, so care is both liberatory and urgent, as well as, as uncomfortable and entangled in histories of violence. I come to this um, studying two organizations that focus on gender and technology in the Global South. One is the Transnational Network, the Association for Progressive Communications, the Women's Rights Program. And the other one is the Co-op Sulabatsu in San Jose, Costa Rica, which I'm going to focus on today. And I also do textual analysis of reports and documents and publications of numerous development agencies, including the United Nations, and the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. So today I will be focusing on solidarity and care and technology in Sulawatsu. Sulawatsu, just so you know a little bit, and I'm gonna uh, talk much more about it, is um, means creative spirit in the indigenous Costa Rican language, Bribri. And it was founded in 2005. It has approximately 20 associates and a core daily working staff of approximately 10 people. They're mostly women, but there are also a couple of men. One of Sulabatsu's main initiatives is to bring women and girls closer to digital technologies through associative technology-based entrepreneurship and supporting women in science and technology fields through trainings, workshops, advocacy, at the local, international, and national levels. So before I start kind of going more into, I just wanna say that how I come to this topic, this book for me is also very personal. I come to this topic after years of, about thinking about the implications of digital technologies for social movements particularly, especially for women's and feminist movements. As a journalist and reporter in Puerto Rico, which is kind of my first career, uh, I lived the digital revolution, right? In the newsroom and the impact it had on journalism, particularly as a business and how it eroded the authority of traditional media. Activists and other communities were increasingly using digital spaces and tools to communicate, distribute their messages and claims, and make the media and other institutions accountable. The feminist movement in Puerto Rico particularly was one of many political actors who embraced digital technologies and spaces. This led me to study the digital media strategies of the feminist movement in Puerto Rico for my master's in journalism. So this book took me back to communities of feminist activists in the global south to understand and contribute to the ways in which they are working in the present to create a liberatory future. So in the context I study, 
politically located in the global south, solidarity and pleasure are not only means of survival for activists, but also subversive tactics. They are woven into the fabric of how they take care of each other and the communities they serve. My definition of solidarity stems from the field. I employ solidarity not as a blind form of unity and harmony, but as an acknowledgement of also of shared interests that centralize the value of difference. By solidarity, I mean horizontal forms of collaboration, kindness, and a profound sense of integrity. Um, I use Rita Segato, and we can talk about citations, right? And how I use citations in my book. Rita Segado is an Argentinian anthropologist, feminist anthropologist. And I use her powerful framework of a politics of connections throughout my, my work to examine the politics of care of both feminist digital activist practices and also of discourse and policy. In a world in which extreme violence, particularly against racialized, minoritized women and feminized bodies in all their diversities and ecological destruction is rampant. Segato proposes a politics in feminine key that reweaves community using the fragments that are left. That's a quote. So she counterposes this politics of connections to a politics of things and the, what she calls the thingification of everything produced by capitalism as the ultimate sign of happiness and success. In the co-op Sulawatsu, where I did uh, ethnographic research, solidarity is part of its everyday practice in the way the members organize, conceptualize their work, and relate to the, each other and the communities they work with. Care is an important part of their feminist techno-political and economic praxis. Their workshops consist of training and basic internet skills, disassembling and reassembling computers, programming with open source code, training women in online security and privacy, and fostering networks between rural women in STEM and creating local entrepreneurial endeavors. The co-op has conducted workshops with sex workers, domestic workers, environmental activists, and indigenous women, and led digital storytelling projects throughout Central America using photography, video, and graffiti. Their administrative structure also, its principles of sharing knowledge, participatory action research, and public art projects are all important parts of its politics of care. So in Sulawatsu, technology is anchored in relationships of solidarity among its members and with their communities and the planet. This is what an indigenous woman from the Cabecar community of the Caribbean Alto Pacuare region of Costa Rica told Kemli Camacho, who is the coordinator of Sulawatsu, during one of their conversations. This petition blew Kemley's mind away. After having worked on technology related issues her whole life and having founded this internationally re re recognized co-op more than 15 years ago, she simply could not wrap her head around the implications of collaborating on the creation of Una Tecnología del Sentir. Actually, this translation, translation is not accurate. It's, we want a technology of feelings. This technology of feelings drastically dif differed from the profit-oriented technologies and ideas that Kemley had worked with her entire life. For these indigenous women whose communities are under the imminent arrival of internet connection, the meaning of co-designing a technology that feels of feelings was grounded in practical results, such as creating a virtual app that could submerge users in their communities and cosmology, or an application connected to sensors that could detect when deforestation trucks entered their lands. 
but their request also surpassed the practical. A technology of feelings is about celebrating their knowledges and ways of being. It is about collaboration, joy, and respect. It, it is about being seen, heard, felt, and seeing, hearing, and feeling. About following rhythms not determined by linearity, assessments, outcomes, and results. And to be able to create a technology that feels we also had to feel them, Kemley told me. The indigenous women told the co-op members that to be able to work together, they had to visit their communities, sleep in their houses, travel their lands, and participate in their ceremonies. And so they did. They crossed rivers and hiked mountains, sometimes for more than 18 hours, under incessant rain, through flooding, and in paths of mud, to feel the communities they were going to start a project with. Emily told me this particularly in one of our many conversations during a raining afternoon in San Jose. The coordinator of the co-op made this seemingly innocuous comment in the midst of co-organizing a high profile Latin American conference for women in the fields of STEM that is characterized as being very corporate and business oriented. She was intent upon inviting indigenous women from Costa Rica to open the conference with a discussion about indigenous science and technologies. After weeks of difficult negotiations with the main organizers, the co-op made this possible. The message was clear. Technologies must be understood within racialized, gendered, and colonial trajectories. The technological allure was thus decentered, and indigenous women were centered as experts, makers, and knowers. This tactic, which was decided upon collectively in the co-op and with the indigenous leaders, held both tremendous intellectual force and emotional intensity. It was a radical act of solidarity and a feminist vision of technology, and most important of what has not been considered technological. Sula Batsu is reimagining technology and the digital society in ways that enable different forms of thinking and being built upon radical interconnectedness. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this body territory assembly, which is a very important uh, concept that has emerged particularly from indigenous uh, thinkers and um, um, activists in Latin America. So this body territory assembly um, theorized by indigenous feminist communitarian thinkers, like they call themselves, they don't call themselves decolonial, uh, such as Lorena Cabnal and Julieta Paredes, reveals three important and interrelated issues that defy mainstream uh, promises of digital inclusion. One, the digital is embodied spatialized and detached from its guise of abstraction. Number two, it demonstrates the ways in which violence is interconnected, crossing numerous realms from the intimate to the territorial. And number three, that technologies can be simultaneously centered and decentered. And I'm going to give you an example. Sulabatsu conducted a two-year project on digital security training for women who work at pineapple cultivations on the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica. And um, in, in, in this project was fascinating because the, the, the defenders, they call uh, women who defend the land uh, in, in Latin America defenders, defensoras. Uh, against the pineapple corporations in Costa Rica, um, both center and decenter the technological and their body territory activism. And I have to say that the pineapple uh, uh, cultivation in Costa Rica is a, mon has, is a monoculture uh, cultivation and it's become highly destructive, highly destructive, and mostly in private, uh, in private hands, multinationals, right? So um, the project they had and which for which they had funding was specifically geared 
on research on the digital vulnerabilities of women environmental leaders at the Piñeras. This is the pineapple cultivation areas, right? Um, and again, I, I just really want to press how, uh, emphasize how highly destructive this has been in Costa Rica. Pineapple cultivation has exhausted the land, undermining the possibilities of other forms of agriculture, allowed multinational corporations to privatize land, contaminate surrounding bodies of water, and exploited the workers. So Elena, who was one of the activists working on this project, um, explained that although funding from the University of Toronto actually focused on digital security training, the co-op immediately realized through their conversations with these defensoras that their priorities were the defense of their lands and their bodies. Elena recalls how these women who led the environmental struggle against the pineapple multinationals had a political awakening that connected the land to their bodies and intimate lives. And she says, we saw patterns in the stories of these women that showed that an internal struggle ensued, ensued when they began participating in the defense of their territories. They started to struggle within their families, defending their bodies. They would tell us, yes, when I started community organizing, I also started to go to school, or that is when I left my husband. So we identified that pattern, the connection between the defense of the territory and the defense of their bodies. So they finally, and it's very interesting, made a manual on digital security training together, but the manual included a lot of issues that weren't necessarily tied to digital security. Um, this is another one of Sula Batsu's project. They hold biannual feminine hackathons, which obviously because of COVID have uh, not restarted. And um, they have organized five hackathons since 2014 in Costa Rica. And their hackathons give another sense of uh, their politics of care, um, feminist techno politics of care. So they have been held in the rural northern region, in the southern part of the country, in Limon, which is on the uh, uh, Caribbean coast, uh, which is mostly black and indigenous, and in the capital, representing many different communities, indigenous, rural, black, and coastal geographic locations. Since 2014, 360 young women have participated. The slogan is, this is not a competition. This is a community gathering. These are their principles. And the hackathons are 36 hour events, nonstop events, where groups of girls and young women design technological prototypes, such as apps, virtual maps, wearable technology, and so forth, with a social justice objective in mind. It's really interesting because participants belong to a spectrum of technological dexterity. The co-op mixes young women who might be in STEM or are studying STEM with women who might not have ever been or had access with a computer or internet, for example. So the intermingling of multiple knowledges is fundamental for the project. There are no winners, rather projects are highlighted. Each hackathon is held after a three month process of selection and participatory research in the communities and regions where the events will be held. And they organize under specific themes such as green technologies, feminist coding, coding urban sustainability or satellite technologies. Participants as an example have designed apps to help teenage mothers find resources, an Amazon style app for shopping in local stores, an app that identifies close public transportation options and a glossary of words chosen and defined by girls so that the adults in their lives understand what they mean by concepts such as stereotypes, conflict resolution and communication. The participants define what they are looking for in technology right, and the problems and the needs of the people of the region. 
One of the most important elements of the hackathons is that juries are composed of both experts from academia and the private and public sectors and members of the community. In the hackathon in Limon, for instance, which is again on the, on the Caribbean coast of the country, which is mostly black and indigenous, um, organizations form part of the jury. And Kemley told me, and this is a quote, this encounter between the tech community and the community is one of the most important aspects of the hackathons. These events might officially end after the 36 hours, right? But the process extends throughout the network of women who continue to work in their communities with each other and with the co-op and offer continuity by participating as godmothers in future hackathons. I wanna go back to the indigenous community that I was talking about at the beginning. In the 2018 hackathon held in the Caribbean town of Limon, two prototypes were highlighted. One of them was Okama Sway, which is translated as white man's technology and cyber trash, uh, a satellite technology that would survey the sea devouring microplastics one of the main contaminants, contaminants of our oceans. So in the, it was in this hackathon that Sulabatsu started working with the indigenous Cabecar and Bribri women from the Alto Pacuare semi-autonomous region in the Caribbean coast. Through Okamasue, indigenous women intend for non-indigenous people to feel their language, traditions, ceremonies, knowledges, and ways of being and thinking. And it's very interesting because I was looking for the website to look at some of the images, but it's locked and I couldn't access it at the moment. But I think that also locking it is part of their politics, right? It's this is not accessible to everyone. They choose who they give access to or not, right? Um, so for instance, they appropriate the way in which their knowledge is traveled through and beyond the internet in another iteration of the ways in which relationships both lie within and surpass technologies. One of the goals of the virtual map, they created a virtual map, which integrates, integrates video, audios, images, and maps in their own language and also in Spanish is to create awareness of the lives and richness of the Cabecat and Bribri communities in developing advocacy campaigns and a course of action to generate policies and procedures to protect indigenous knowledge in Costa Rica. The relationship between these, between the activists I work with, right, and these indigenous leaders has extended way beyond the hackathon. Um, and Okamasue has now become a central project for Sulawatsu and has transformed its vision of technology. So in the launch of Okamasue in July 2021, which I attended via Zoom, the women, the indigenous women presented their project and talked about the co-designing process, um, particularly with the icons they decided to use, right? The co-designing uh, is with the Sulawatsu activists, right? They did this together. So the co-designer from Sulawatsu, who is one of the activists I interview, mentioned that during the process of design, she had learned a lot and her perspectives as a Western woman had been constantly challenged. One of the things that challenged her, for instance, was that when they were discussing what icon they were gonna use for economy, for talking about the economy, uh, the indigenous told, women told her that it had to be represented by women holding hands because that's the way they view economy and what economic relationships are as sharing. Um, and I remember Kemley saying in that, in that particular presentation, and this is a quote, it is very, very important to state that these women's knowledges can never, never be contained in a technological device. So very much tied to this, and I think it's a lot about what we also need to talk more about today is not only the what organizers and activists and, part, and practitioners and scholars do, right? And, but how we do it, right? 
how do we do it? But when I say about how is, what are the, what are the things we are practicing amongst us, right? Because sometimes there are organizations and Sulabatsu is a co-op. It can be considered in some ways an NGO. We can talk more about that. Um, that works within certain systems, so is restricted in some ways, but also works beyond those systems, some subverting a lot of what those systems are, are, are trying to um, perpetuate, right? Um, and uh, I'm very fascinated about this idea of living the world you imagine. So in, in terms of organizations which are living uh, beings, right? They're living organisms, right? Um, in terms of organizations, we sometimes see a lot about what they do, but we don't see how they work with each other, right? What are the systems? What are the things that are in place? And many times there's um, uh, a disconnect from what organizations do and profess to how they relate to each other. And this is a very important part of what I think we need to look at. And in Sulabatsu particularly, I call it living the world you imagine. It's, it's impossible to understand this organization without understanding its relationships. Its members bond, bonds, their income and knowledge is collectivized. They have horizontal structures of administration. Um, and all of this is connected, right? They're deeply connected with their work on technology. They live the world they imagine, which is non-hierarchical, horizontal, collective, and affectionate, right? They have an office, a beautiful office in, in San Jose. It's organized as an office, as an open space full of natural light where everyone can look at each other. They every day at 3 p.m. we had coffee together, an almost sacred daily bonding ritual. They work, talk, and laugh, and also move through conflicts because there's always conflicts, right? This is, does not mean that there's no conflicts regarding differences in approaches, styles, and objectives. They have arguments on issues that range from funding sources to religion and sexuality. And when I arrived for the first time in the summer of 2015, there was something happening precisely that I just couldn't articulate at first. Since the beginning of my fieldwork, I was already trying to understand the meaning of solidarity in the co-op's organizational rhythm and the relationships among its members and others. There, this was a rhythm that didn't follow a linear progressive uh, development. They move organically, collectively, with unstructured schedules. Sometimes they document their projects, other times there's no paper trail, and some initiatives are impossible to articulate in sentences with commas and periods. Other times they simply do not have time or resources. Their projects and communities do have to abide by specific procedures of grants and funders with clear objectives assessments, reports, statistics, and lists of outcomes. And yet there's also an emphasis on process, on experimentation, on learning from mistakes that goes beyond collecting data. It's, this is a, a, a quote from one of, it, of, it, of the activists. Its members most treasured goal is to sustain relationships of care, among themselves and the communities they work with. There continues to be an emphasis on joy, on dreaming the impossible and returning to the drawing board as many times as necessary. They make space to start over, reflect and regret. They make time for long conversations on work related and personal problems and hopes. Thus, their vision is precisely about creating and imagining technologies of feeling as imagined by the indigenous Kabeka women. None of this means, this, these are images of Sulawatsu, none of this means that work is not being done. The key is to understand who defines what work looks like. 
the Sulabatsu collective work when loving, caring for each other, and sharing coffee with natija, guava jam, and fresh bread every day. They work when they talk about their lives, heartbreaks, mistakes, and regrets. They work during those long conversations in the van, traveling around Costa Rica, while Juan drives from the north to the south, from the Caribbean to the Pacific coast and back. They are also working when they interrupt everything to help a coworker who is depressed. This is all part of the everyday labor at the co-op. Emotions and reasons are imbricated, seamlessly woven into each other against modernist dualist ways of thinking and being. And I really love this quote by uh, Leanne Berasalmo Sake Simpson. Uh, in her quest to disengage from modern colonial epistemologies and ways of producing knowledge, Leanne Simpson says that at first, she did not fully appreciate how the Nishnabeg, her own community in Canada, produced theory through practice. And she writes, and I'm gonna, this is just so beautiful. It became clear to me that how we live, how we organize, how we engage in the world the process not only frames the outcome, it is the transformation. How molds and that gives birth. The how changes us. How is the theoretical intervention? It has been for me precisely Sulavatsu's how that alerted me to the meanings of a feminist technopolitics of care. The defense of life is crucial in a world in which colonial capitalist policies which govern most of our technologies, increasingly thrive on the extraction, exploitation, and dispossession of life, human and non-human. And that is what La Cope does. They defend life, a dignified life, um, forging a politics of connection. These relationships of solidarity not only denounce, and for me, this is the key, but they also announce the possibility of more just worlds where everyone, the land, animals, humans, and objects can, floor, can flourish together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Farouz. That was a very crucial and important presentation and description and really helping us experience a specific way to generate knowledge. And I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, you can I see there is- I took more time than I thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no one, no I one- I thought it was uh... 25 minutes. <laughs> There's no problem there. It was, it was every minute was extremely valuable. Uh, <laughs> no problem at all. <laughs> you can see that everyone in the chat feels the same. Um, but I just, I'm sorry. I took a little bit more time. I think I talked too slowly. It's just that I'm so interested in what all of, you know, what you also have to say. So, <laughs> well, we can, we can always have um, many, many conversations about it in the forum. So I'm going to just turn it over to people in the room who have questions. And uh, I see we have uh, Mish. Go ahead. Hi, Mish. Hello. <clears throat> First, I just want to say um, thank you for how you presented intersectionality at a global scale, um, but also commonality of uh, issues um, that we see globally. Um, I also really appreciated how you uh, made it so, um, how you distilled the connection between technology and violence and the rise of violence against women that we kind of don't necessarily think about at the forefront. Um, but the last piece is I really appreciate, and this is as a mom who uh, homeschooled um, her three children <laughs> wow. who still to this day complain how unfair it was that they had to do um, AP calculus with their mom <laughs> and physics. But um, talking about the data with the contextualized story, as opposed to talking about data equity with 
count data or point data. Um, I, I can't express how, um, in my work, I do data storytelling. And what I get often is, Mish, just give us the data. Just tell us, Mish, you know, kind of get, get to the heart, get to the real part of it. But um, how you talked about the data just really brings to the forefront the extraction of which you spoke, right? We extract data from communities that we say have power, but who really don't have power in the construct of oppression. And then we say, we're not sure what's wrong with you. Let's extract more data without understanding, without the extractors really fully realizing that they are the foundation of that which they're seeking to solve. Um, so it was just, it was, it was beautifully told. And um, even though you spoke about people, it was amazing because as you spoke so lyrically in my head, I could see like data and concepts. And so it was quite beautiful. And I look forward to um, reading your book. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Your your how do I pronounce your name? Mish? Mish, you did yes. <laughs> So first of all, thank you so much for your kind words. I really, and, and thank you so much, really. I, I, that's exactly, you know, some of the reflections I, I hope to provoke. Uh, also, oh my God, my total admiration for um, homeschooling your kids during, <laughs> wow. I mean, you know, really, I honor you. And, um, and yeah, I think, I, I mean, you said it better than, you know, than I could. It's exactly that. It's how we, we humanize, right? Um, a lot of these things and uh, really look at people beyond that. And also uh, looking at those relationships we form with people and these uh, models of extraction, which are still so, so common and persistent, which we would think that they wouldn't be, but they still are. And it's something I struggle against a lot. You know, I, I say I wrestle with many demons because for me, it's also been a process, right? How do I do this in a way that's careful, that's respectful, that's in some way um, reciprocal in some way, um, hopefully. Um, but that's also uncomfortable, right? I talk about that discomfort is constant in the sense that um, the way these hierarchies are, are built, particularly in academia, are so powerful um, that it's it's very difficult to, um, to 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 build these kinds of relationships. Yes, yes. I look forward to seeing more from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mish. We'll make sure that we put a link to the book in the community forum. And uh, we have another person with their hand raised. Go ahead, Marcella. We can't hear you yet. Okay. Oh, there we now go. Can you hear? All right. Yeah, thanks. So thank you for your presentation. Um, I am from the Global South, and, and I appreciate your perspective on, on how women, how we women from the, from the Global South interact and how we uh, implement this solidarity that you describe. Um, but uh, the last slide was what struck me, and I wanted you to comment a little bit more on that. I'm, I'm an evaluator, a qualitative evaluator with, a, with an, an anthropological background. And so we're always, you know, saying, okay, in an evaluation, you have to go and answer the who, the what, the when, the how, and the why. And, and one of your last slides says, the how changes us. Mm -hmm. And the how is the theoretical intervention. Mm -hmm. Can you, exp you know, as a qualitative researcher, I'm all about understanding the how the why is generated, but can you, ex you know, mm. elaborate a little bit more about what this phrase, the how changes us, where does it come from? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, you know, I think, I think for me, at least in, in this particular work, there's two hows, right? It's first when I, when I entered the field, so to say, I wasn't, I wasn't, I never thought solidarity would be one of the things I would have uh, I never thought that their practices of solidarity would actually be the theoretical intervention, for instance, right? 
their practices of solidarity. Um, I went to study coding and this and that and apps and entrepreneurship. I didn't, you know, that, that was, those were the ideas I had. I never thought I was going to encounter what I encountered. So it's a great thing when you go to field work and so many different things come out, right? So, so those practices of solidarity among the Sulawatsu activists and with the communities they work with uh, is their how, right? How do they do what they do? And that is the theoretical intervention, not only mine, but also theirs, right? It's also theirs in terms of, um, you know, people and activists and community members and Black and Indigenous people. They're also theorists, right? Um, so, which is a, a, a terrible binary that, that in academia, you know, uh, we hold on to. So that's one of the hows for me, right? When, how people do what they do, how do they relate to each other? Not, not only what is the outcome, but actually looking inside, right? And, and then there's the how for me, right? Which for me, it's very interesting because, uh, you know, uh, how, how could I, how did I relate with these activists during these seven, eight years I've been, you know, uh, already working with them, right? Um, how could I do that in the, I'm talking about solidarity and pleasure and joy in this book. How could I do that in a way that was also honest and uh, faithful to what I'm talking about? Because imagine I'm talking about feminism, I'm talking about solidarity, and then I would be practicing something that's absolutely disconnected from what I'm theorizing and talking about, right? So from my feminist praxis, right, really trying that that how could be as um, as, as solidarity based as possible. How did I do that? I wrote this is all in a methodological appendix, which I hate because I do say that in the book. But the methods are usually relegated to the very end of the book when methods, which is the how, should be all over the book. We don't do anything without the how, right? Not theory, not framing, not data collection, nothing. Um, so I dealt with that really forming relationships of, of bonding with these activists, you know, and uh, like I say, uh, being a compañera, a companion, uh, which doesn't mean not being critical, uh, which means really, really being embedded with them and understanding them and, uh, and, and believing in them and um, trying to build reciprocal relationships. Thank you. I love the idea <laughs> that uh, a researcher as companion, uh, we have a, a lot of practical questions still in the chat that we'll, we'll get to another, another time, another day. Uh, this is not the last conversation for sure we'll have around this, but um, I think you're right. One of, one of the ways that we set up the stage in research, whatever kind of research, whatever kind of methodology, as soon as we believe this myth that the researcher needs to be other in order for the research to be good, um, you know, we've, we've lost the thread, um, whatever methodology you're going to use and researcher as, as a companion, a true companion is essential, whether you're doing quantitative research, qualitative research, research that's coming from indigenous ways of knowing research that's coming from, um, settler way of knowing, uh, there, that's such a fundamental approach and attitude that will get past some of the intellectual sticking points <laughs> where we can get stuck because of our conditioning and our training and just taking a breath and remembering like researcher as companion, um, is, is I think, uh, where we will have to leave it for now <laughs> so that, um, we can all continue on, uh, the path that is our day. Um, but Peruz, I, I cannot thank you enough for again, taking an entire hour out of your very valuable fieldwork time in Puerto Rico, your sabbatical time, um, the, the gratitude and appreciation for the content of what you shared and also the, the way that you shared it with us uh, and the way that you 
um, became a companion to all of us today and really helped us feel less alone and more hopeful that getting the equity that we want in the evidence and knowledge that we're generating is possible. And uh, so grateful. Um, I know that there are lots of questions. We, we will get to those questions another time. We will put links uh, uh, to Dr. Vajay's book, which I know you're all going to purchase and read, including the methods section in the back. <laughs> um, some people are saying, do you do private counseling? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I'll, I'll let them reach out to you individually. But um, thank I you really- so Thank you. And feel free to email me. I put it there, but I'm sure Heather, you know, I, my, 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 my work email and, um, uh, uh, and, you know, thank you. I can see all these comments, but they look great. What I've seen. Thank you so much for this audience and for the invitation. It's really been a great opportunity. I love, I love talking about this. I think we need to talk more about, you know, um, yeah, looking at, uh, at the difficult also, but looking at the hopeful. Absolutely. We definitely do. And um, thank you for uh, doing that in such an uh, impactful way with us today. Really, really appreciate it. And the, all the things that you can't see zooming by in the chat are essentially thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great rest of your day. Um, and thank you to everyone who came and spent your value, very valuable hour with us as well. Um, we are back uh, next Friday, next Friday, same time, same Zoom link. And we have um, Dr. Luisa Burrell joining us, who's going to talk about her work on the Hispanic paradox. I should say their work, sorry, my mistake, their work on the Hispanic paradox and practical ways to think about collecting data especially in the United States, about um, people who might identify as Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, what it means from a human and a policy perspective to uh, collect data on that, tell stories uh, with data on that, and pros and cons. So that's what we'll be talking about next week. Um, have a fabulous rest of your day and a restful and full weekend. Thank you, everyone. Happy weekend. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.